all those mysteries about the house are slowly revealed to us, the reader. Did you predict any of them? I'm Roger and this is Bookshook and today's podcast is all about the second half of Piranesi by Susanna Clarke. So, the idea of the podcast is that we'll spend a month reading a book, hopefully together. I'll split the book into two equal halves and discuss the first half on the second Friday of the month and the second part on the last Friday of the month. I'll be sharing your thoughts and mine, asking loads of questions, discussing ideas, making predictions, and we'll decide what type of person we'd recommend the book to, if at all. I'd love you to read alongside. Of course, you don't have to read anything at all. You can audible or just listen to the podcast since I will be summarising what happens. But be aware, there will be spoilers. You can leave a comment or start a conversation at the Bookshook YouTube channel or send an email to bookshook at yahoo.com. I love reading your comments. Welcome to Bookshook. So this podcast is all about the second half of Piranesi from part four to the end. So at the beginning of part four, Piranesi extracts those pieces of paper from the herring gull's nest and they are the writings of a captor, possibly Piranesi himself. Quote, I am losing my mind. How horrible, how terrible to be in this dreadful place and mad. I'm determined to kill him before this happens, before I forget why I hate him. Piranesi wonders whether to tell the other of those names in his journal. The other has forgotten about the ritual to the stars. Piranesi thinks he smells the lemon fragrance of 16. Now, remember, 16 is this other person that he thinks might be in the house. The other says 16 needs to be killed. He also says that he should tell him if an old man appears. Piranesi thinks 16 has left directions. And didn't Lawrence, the prophet, say he would leave directions? The other says it may be 16. And Piranesi discovers the other searching for Raphael. Piranesi sees 16 writing by torchlight and she screams when she sees some rooks but the writing is obscured because Piranesi doesn't read it for fear of being infected. Piranesi confronts the other that 16 is a woman and the other says I didn't want you to fall in love with her and I'm thinking this is surely Sylvia D'Agostino who went missing after chatting with Dr Alsted. And the fragment of writing refers to Lawrence possibly being an occultist. Piranesi looks up Lawrence in his journals and there is a reference to Angerhard Scott saying that Lawrence Arne Sales had an extraordinary effect on his followers, getting them to believe that they had seen other worlds, etc. Piranesi muses that, quote, this told me very little about Lawrence Arne Sales himself. It was the last entry of all that was the most informative. And continuing the quote... Where Arne Sales diverged from his peers was in his insistence that this dialogue between the ancients and the world was not simply something that happened in their heads. It was something that happened in the actual world. The way the ancients perceived the world was the way the world truly was. This gave them extraordinary influence and power. Reality was not only capable of taking part in a dialogue, intelligible and articulate, it was also persuadable. Nature was willing to bend to men's desires, to lend them its attributes. Seas could be parted, men could turn into birds and fly away, or into foxes and hide in dark woods. Castles could be made out of clouds. Eventually, the ancients ceased to speak and listen to the world. When this happened, the world did not simply fall silent. It changed. Those aspects of the world that had been in constant communication with men, whether you call them energies, powers, spirits, angels or demons, no longer had a place or a reason to stay. And so they departed. There was, in Arne Sales' view, an actual, real disenchantment. In his third book, there is a reference to a seer, Adi Damaris, quote, who had been able to walk the path between worlds. And Arne Sales' most famous theory is documented. Quote, The theory of other worlds, simply put, it said that when knowledge or power went out of this world, it did two things. First, it created another place, and second, it left a hole, a door between this world where it had once existed and the new place it had made. Ultimately, Lawrence finds an entrance to the house in Lyme Regis. Quote, in short, one must return to the last place in which one had stood before the iron hand of modern rationality grit one's mind. For me, this was the garden of the house where I grew up in Lyme Regis. He continues, I focused on my memory of being a child in that garden, of the last time when both the world and my mind had been unfettered. Continuing on, all around me, doors into other worlds began appearing, but I knew the one I wanted, the one into which everything forgotten flows. 
The edges of that door were frayed and worn by the passage of old ideas leaving this world. The door was perfectly visible now. It was in a gap between the Antoine Rivoire and the Coquette de Blage. I stepped through. I was standing in a vast chamber with stone floors and walls of marble. I was surrounded by eight massive statues, each one different, each depicting a minotaur. A great marble staircase rose up to a great height and descended to an equally disorientating depth. A strange thundering, as of a sea, filled my ears. Continuing the narrative, Piranesi predicts there will be a great flood and tells the other. Piranesi wants to inform Sixteen but doesn't know how, so he decides to write a message to her. He sees a message saying, Are you Matthew Rose Sorensen? And enters a vision of the real world. But humorously, quote, Just as the world trembled on the brink of conscious thought, it vanished and so too did the image. I was in the real world again. (laughs) Back in his real world, which is the house. He tries to find evidence of his existence in his journals, and he discovers Kettersley lived in Battersea Park. There are missing pages from a page on Kettersley, but he has the missing pages from the 88th Western Hall. Piranesi, i.e. Sorensen, starts reading from the Pieced Together journal, which takes us on to part five. And here we have the narrator, Matthew Rose Sorensen, recounting visiting Valentine Ketterly at his house. Quote, I remember how the smell of rain that pervaded the streets did not die away as I entered, but somehow intensified. Inside the house there was a smell of rain, clouds and air, a smell of limitless space, a smell of the sea, which made no sense at all in a Victorian terraced house in Battersea. <laughs> Matthew says he's interested in researching how transgressive ideas are received, and Ketterly explains that Arne Sales was intellectually honest. When Sorensen refutes the idea, Ketterly says, I don't like you very much. Ketterly explains some people are able to see these labyrinthine worlds without a ritual, to do it at will, and Arne Sales and Agostino could... Ketterly asks whether anyone else knows where Sorensen is, and he replies, no, no one else knows where I am at the moment. And I'm thinking, "Uh uh-oh, is Sorensen about to get trapped? Quote, we looked at each other with a sort of mutual dislike. I was about to rise and go when he suddenly said, and this is Ketterly, do you really want to understand Lawrence and the hold he has over us? Yes, I said, of course. Then in that case, we should perform the ritual. The ritual, I said, yes. The ritual reminds me a little bit of reading books. In order to get to a fantastic land, you need to read a book. But then, without the ritual, you can just use your memory to remember those fabulous lands. Ketterly says to Sorensen, quote, let's do the ritual now. It only takes 12 minutes. He sets a candle on the floor and Ketterly starts chanting in Britonic, which is a mixture of Welsh, Cornish and Breton. Sorensen appears in the Minotaur room and Ketterly laughs a wicked laugh. And Sorensen says to Ketterly, put me back. And then we get into part six. Sorensen realises the other, Ketterly, is his enemy and he had used the name Piranesi so that he wouldn't remember his actual name, Sorensen. And he tested his memory by saying Battersea, and Ketterly's memory is fine because he went back to the other world frequently. So I'm thinking, can all these dead bodies be accounted for in some way? Is he some kind of serial killer, and he's storing the dead bodies there, or is it just a portal and those people have died before? Interesting questions. And a major question will be, will he be able to remember that, quote, the other is not your friend? He plans on writing it everywhere that he can. And he plans to lie about the flood and say, I was deceived, and then tie the other with nets to a statue so that he drowns. I'm thinking, but won't that destroy his means of escape? And also, is this 16, Matthew Rose Sorensen, that split personality figure that we saw earlier? 16 is the realisation of who he really is. Piranesi will, quote, forget and then, quote, encounter Sorensen as person number 16. Could be a bit far-fetched. But he does, right at the beginning of the novel, say, the 16th person... Are you a traveller who has cheated tides and crossed broken floors and derelict stairs to reach these halls? So I'm thinking it could be just another part of Sorensen's personality. 
although that could be a red herring. And there's another spanner in the works, which is that he heard her being frightened by the rooks and she was cursing at them. But she was never seen, so I still might be right, I don't know. Unless there is about to be a major twist... Anyway, continuing the narrative, Sorensen, or Piranesi, the narrator, travels to the 6th North Western Hall where he had written the message to warn 16 of the storm. And the message is destroyed, so he rewrites the message to warn her and he removes the remains of the bodies that will get damaged in the flood. And the narrator discovers, so when I say the narrator, I mean Piranesi or Sorensen, discovers a bag containing a gun and a canoe. He takes the gun to throw into the tides, but then replaces it in a bag. Why? He should keep hold of that gun, I think. Anyway, the narrator waits for 16, and there's a reminder clue that 16 is Matthew Rowe Sorensen, I think, and not another person, or, for example, D'Agostino. Listen to this, quote, I remembered the words of the prophet, the closer 16 gets, the more dangerous Ketterly will become. Although I may be wrong with this. Anyway, the great flood does eventually come. And there's another major reference to the narrator's bipolarity when, quote, this is the other he's talking about, he walked briskly across the first vestibule, east to west. His head was ducked down against the rain. His clothes were strikingly different from what he usually wore. Jeans, an old jumper and sneakers, and over his jumper an old sort of harness. Life jacket, I thought. Or rather, Matthew Rowe Sorensen thought it inside my head. Matthew Rowe Sorensen in my head. Surely this is 16. Again, I could be wrong. The other is pumping up the boat and sees the narrator. And the other says, quote, I've had to change my plans. It's a pain, but there it is. Raphael is coming here and, like it or not, we're going to finish this. So no nonsense from you, all right? Because I swear, Piranesi, I've just about had enough from everyone. And the narrator remembers the name Raphael, but the other just ignores him. The gun is now lying by the side of the hall, having been emptied out of the bag. And the other tells the narrator to get into the boat and says, quote, If Raphael tries to get into it with us or to hang on to it, use your paddle to strike at her hands and head. And then I'm thinking, well, Raphael is not a female name. Is the other trying to continue the idea that 16 is a female and is out there somewhere? Or is it just a part of Matthew Sorensen's split personality? Or is that a red herring? 16 calls out, I've come for Matthew Rose Sorensen. So 16 is a female person. Boo, I got it all wrong. 16 wore, quote, jeans and a green jumper. Her dark hair was pulled back into a ponytail. She's a very much a real person. They escape from the tide upwards, but the narrator gets shot at by Ketterly, or he believes he gets shot at, and Ketterly disappears into the waves dead. So 16 is Sarah Raphael, and she's not a figment of the narrator's split personality, but a police officer. And I'm thinking, really? That's a bit mundane. But, you know, respect to Susanna Clark, you got me fooled. Unless there's another twist coming, and I'm holding out. Continuing on, police officer Sarah Raphael says that she'll take him home because his mum, dad, sisters and friends want to see him. But he says he has to attend to the bones of 13 inhabitants. And she says, quote, 13 people? Raphael's dark eyes were wide with astonishment. My God, are they all right? Yes, I said, they're fine. I take good care of them. The narrator has to add Ketterly to the bodies to care for. And Raphael says she'll be back tomorrow. And the narrator says he'll have made his decision as to whether to see his family by then. The narrator finds the body of Ketterly and makes peace with him. And the reason that Raphael managed to get into the house is she followed a lead from Angerad Scott. So Angerad Scott wrote a book about Lawrence Aaron Sales. Quote, six years ago, you contacted her. You told her that you were also thinking of writing a book about Aaron Sales. And the two of you had a long conversation. Then she never heard from you again. In May of this year, she called the college in London where you used to work because she wanted to know what had happened about the book, whether you were still writing it. The people at the college told her that you were missing, that you'd been missing pretty much the entire time since she'd first spoken to you. That rang all sorts of warning bells for Mrs. Scott because she she knew about the people who had disappeared around Arn Sales. Raphael explains how she found the narrator. Quote, 
Arn Sales told us the truth straight away. He said you were in the labyrinth, but of course, well, we thought he was just trying to wind us up, which was right. He was just trying to wind us up. My colleagues put up with it for a while, but they gave up on him eventually. I had a different idea. I thought, he likes talking, just let him. Eventually he'll say something useful. She tapped her shiny little device. It spoke with Lawrence Arn Sales, haughty, drawling voice. So this is obviously a video. Continuing on. Quote, you think that all my talk about other worlds is irrelevant, but it isn't. It's absolutely key. Matthew Rowe Sorensen attempted to enter another world. If he hadn't done that, he wouldn't have disappeared, as you call it. He made the attempt to reach another world, not because he thought the other world existed, but because he thought the attempt itself would grant him insight into my thinking, into me. And now you're going to do the same. Me? Raphael sounded startled. Yes, and you're going to do it for the exact same reason that Rose Sorensen did it. He wanted to understand my thinking. You want to understand his. Adjust your perceptions in the way I am about to describe to you. Perform the actions that I will outline for you and then you will know. What will I know, Lawrence? You'll know what happened to Matthew Rose Sorensen. It's that simple, she says. Oh yes, it's that simple. Continuing on, Arn Sales described what to do, how to go back to a pre-rational mode of thought. He said that when I'd done that, I'd see paths all around me, and he told me which one to choose. I thought he meant metaphorical paths. It was a bit of a shock when it turned out he didn't. So that's how she found him. It reminds me of Lee's go through the motions from East of Eden, this following a ritual, if you read that. Raphael explains that in, quote, the house, only representations of the world exist. Quote, here you can only see a representation of a river or a mountain, but in our world, the other world, you can see the actual river and the actual mountain. This annoyed me. And Piranesi says, I do not see why you say I can only see a representation in this world, I said with some sharpness. The word only suggests a relationship of inferiority. You make it sound as if the statue is somehow inferior to the thing itself. I do not see that that is the case at all. I would argue that the statue is superior to the thing itself, the statue being perfect, internal, and not subject to decay. And in the margin here I wrote, a true artist's house where representation is everything. And then he takes her on a guided tour of the house. He takes her to the bodies and she believes at least one was murdered by Arne Sales. Quote, I remembered how Raphael had wondered which of the people of the alcove had been murdered and how the simple fact of her posing the question had made the whole world seem a darker, sadder place. Perhaps that is what it is like being with other people. Perhaps even people you like and admire immensely can make you see the world in ways you would rather not. Perhaps that is what Raphael means. The narrator prepares to leave so as to not be alone. And Matthew Sorensen is now back in the real world and he finds it baffling in places. Quote, Piranesi has a strong dislike of money. Piranesi wants to say, but I need the things you have, so why don't you just give it to me? And then when I have something you need, I'll just give it to you. This would be a simpler and much better system. Very good point. He comes and goes as he pleases between the worlds. He has even taken James Ritter back to the house. And when he looks at the statues, they remind him of Dr. Ketterly. Quote, I think of Dr. Ketterly and an image rises up in my mind. It is the memory of a statue that stands in the 19th North, the Western Hall. It is the statue of a man kneeling on his plinth. A sword lies at his side, its blade broken in five pieces. Round about lie other broken pieces, the remains of a sphere. The man has used his sword to shatter the sphere because he wanted to understand it. But now he finds that he has destroyed both sphere and sword. This puzzles him, but at the same time part of him refuses to accept that the sphere is broken and worthless. He has picked up some of the fragments and stares at them intently in the hope that they will eventually bring him new knowledge. The other always wanted more knowledge. He wasn't interested in what was in the house. He wanted to pray to the stars for more knowledge. Nothing was ever enough. Really reminds me of Eel from The Moon and the Bonfires. Continuing the comparison, we have one statue that is compared to Lawrence R. Stiles. Quote, An image rises up in my mind. It is the memory of a statue that stands in the upper vestibule facing the head of a staircase, the one rising up out of the 32nd vestibule. This statue represents a heretical pope seated on a throne. He is fat and bloated. He lolls on his throne, a shapeless mass. The throne is magnificent, but the sheer bulk of the figure threatens to split it into two. He knows that he is repulsive, but you can see by his 
face that the idea pleases him. He revels in the thought that he is somehow shocking. In his face there is mingled laughter and charm. Look at me, he seems to say. Look at me. He thinks of Raphael as a queen in her chariot, but also a figure holding a lantern. And the narrator continues by saying how he can go back to the house at any time with his imagination, his theatre of dreams. The book ends with the narrator noticing people that he sees in the real world who were, quote, noble and great statues in the house. What a beautiful book. So I was wrong in predicting that 16 was the part of the narrator that knows, i.e. Matthew Sorensen. It was actually this kindly police officer. The great technique the author used by introducing the character very late in the book meant that it was not really possible to guess who 16 is and ends with the reader going on a wild goose chase with herself or himself like I did. At least that's what I think. I love the idea of this house as a theatre of the imagination. We all have the ability to enter this world just by sitting and reading a book using a portal and after by willing it into our existence I can visualise those statues staring at the moon in wonder and I can imagine the fledgling albatross taking its first faltering steps. It's a lovely comment on literature I think. It's interesting how she chose the house and the statues as a place to create this world. Perhaps if it was me, it would be a beautiful garden with mountains and streams. But that's just, I guess, there's probably a reason for it. What do you think the reason is? I know she's influenced by Pyrenees' drawings. Why do you think it's a big house with statues rather than an Eden or a make-believe forest or something with statues? I'd be interested in your thoughts. Anyway, let's look at those questions at the end of the first half. So we found out why the pages of his journal were removed. And then we found out who the other is, the secret knowledge. Will the ritual ever work? We never really found out whether Ketterly went to the stars to do his ritual again. And Adi Damaris, we found out, he was the seer that could get into these worlds. Should we be trying to unravel the secrets of the house? That was a question that the author posed to us. I think, yeah, definitely. There were definitely the secrets of the house. I think that was a bit of a red herring, the idea that we shouldn't be looking for answers. And who wrote those notes found in the 88th Western Hall? It was the narrator. Will Peridisi escape from this trap? Yes, he did. What is the house? It is a portal into another world. Would I recommend this book? Absolutely. The kind of person that I'd recommend it to, someone who's quite interested in fantasy maybe and is interested in ideas of art and maybe architecture and someone who doesn't mind fantasy really. So it comes highly recommended. A wonderful book. I'm really happy to have read it even though I managed to make a lot of assumptions which turned out to be completely incorrect. I'd like to talk a little bit now about October's book, 2666 or 2666 by Roberto Bolaño, published in 2004. If you're reading alongside, I'll be reading up to the dot on page 445. The very next sentence makes mention of Cale Santa Catarina, if you're not sure exactly what I mean. But yeah, in my version, it's exactly halfway. So I chose the book because... I actually bumped into a friend and he mentioned that Bologna was a great read and he recommended 2666. I don't know anything about it. We didn't really talk about the book. I'm going to read the first page and just have some initial impressions. The first chapter is called The Part About the Critics. Here we go. The first time that Jean-Claude Pelletier read Benno von Archimboldo was Christmas 1980 in Paris, when he was 19 years old and studying German literature. The book in question was Da Sonval. The young Pelletier didn't realise at the time that the novel was part of a trilogy made up of the English-themed The Garden and the Polish-themed The Leather Mask, together with the clearly French-themed Da Sonval. But this ignorance, or lapse, or bibliographical lacuna, attributable only to his extreme youth, did nothing to diminish the wonder and admiration that the novel stirred in him. From that day on, or from the early morning hours when he concluded his maiden reading, he became an enthusiastic Archimboldian and set out on a quest to find more works by the author. This was no easy task. 
Getting hold of books by Benno von Archimboldi in the 1980s, even in Paris, was an effort not lacking all kinds of difficulties. Almost no reference to Archimboldi could be found in the university's German department. Pelletier's professors had never heard of him. One said he thought he recognised the name. Ten minutes later, to Pelletier's outrage and horror, he realised that the person his professor had in mind was the Italian painter regarding whom he soon revealed himself to be equally ignorant. Pelletier wrote to the Hamburg publishing house that had published D'Arsonval and received no response. He also scoured the few German bookstores he could find in Paris. The name Archimboldi appeared in a dictionary of German literature and in a Belgian magazine devoted, whether as a joke or seriously he never knew, to the literature of Prussia. In 1981, he made a trip to Bavaria with three friends from the German department and there, in a little bookstore in Munich on Volamstrasse, he found two other books, the stim volume titled Mitzi's Treasure, less than 100 pages long, and the aforementioned English novel The Garden. Reading these two novels only reinforced the opinion he'd already formed of Archimboldi. In 1983, at the age of 22, he undertook the task of translating Da Saint-Val. No one asked him to do it. At the time, there was no French publishing house interested in publishing the German author with the funny name. Essentially, Pelletier set out to translate the book because he liked it and because he enjoyed the work, although it occurred to him that he could submit the translation prefaced with a study of the Archimboldian oeuvre as his thesis, and why not, as the foundation of his future dissertation. He completed the final draft of the translation in 1984, and the Paris publishing house, after some inconclusive and contradictory readings, accepted it and published Archimboldi. Though the novel seemed destined from the start not to sell more than a thousand copies, the first printing of 3,000 was exhausted after a couple of contradictory, positive, even effusive reviews, opening the door for second, third and fourth printings. By then, Pelletier had read 15 books by the German writer, translated two others, and was regarded almost universally as the preeminent authority on Benno von Archimboldi across the length and breadth of France. There we go. So, very literary, lots of references to other countries and quite a large diction and quite academic in its background. Thanks very much for listening. If you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear them. The email is bookshook at yahoo.com or you can leave a comment on the Bookshook YouTube channel. And if you want to recommend a future book to read together, do let me know. I look forward to discussing this first part of 2666 on the next episode of Bookshook on Friday the 8th of October. See you then. Mm -hmm.